Hi there. This is Manuel Blanco, Gage Cash founder. And this is Gage, Gage Cash lecture number two. And today I want to talk about, um, well, Gage Cash, of course, in relationship to Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Tether. As you can see there in, in the screen, in the website of CoinMarketCap, um, these three projects are still at the top of the valuation and um, usually volume as well. Um, and it's very important to understand uh, gauge cash uh, around these projects because um, if we happen to be successful uh, going forward with which which is the idea um, we can be we can top these projects out in terms of market cap and i will explain why so let's remember that in the last uh, lecture i said that um, i i went to explain what is gauge cash and the fast answers is, is the world series decentralized monetary system the other one is that it is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, a stable one. Um, and the key concept there, or the new concepts there are stable and decentralized. Um, and, but we need to understand the, the, the story of uh, Bitcoin probably, um, to understand gauge cash and Ethereum as well and Tether as well. And um, so this this lecture will be, uh, I will not go through much uh, through the point of view of uh, traditional finance over the counter markets, monetary policy. Uh, those I will leave it for, for the next lectures. Today, I just want you to grasp the idea of um, what is what is the role that gauge cash can play in the crypto space? Um, and what I said last time is like uh, just to super emphasize that part is gauge cash is not a project for the crypto space, or not only it has many use cases. Um, in the finance sector and in the and, and it is a project for everyone, everywhere. It solves the problem of hyperinflation, inflation, um, stability of prices, and those are good elements for uh, people to, to establish their economy and grow, okay? Um, but today uh, we will get a uh, deep dive into um, the, a little bit of the crypto history and why the necessity of something like like H cash uh, it didn't ca came out of nowhere. Um, there's a problem here that we needed to solve, and we solved it. Um, uh, as I said in, in other uh, presentations or talking to other people professional people. Um, we're not a project that just wanted to participate in the crypto fashion 2017 ICO, uh, bunch of pro projects just getting speculative money out of people. Um, we came from a different background. Um, we wanted to be the largest private equity fund in the history of Latin America using blockchain technology. And again, I said last time for that, you need, uh, if you are not invested in the asset that uh, the economic layer is embedded in, in which you are building, in this case, we were building in Ethereum, um, then you need to hedge that. And that is, um, there are some solutions from the tra traditional uh, finance point of view, um, you can hedge it uh, with a brokerage financial firm or a liquidity provider that offers you the counterpart. 
of a short, let's say, um, in a contracts for different market or a, a direct market. Um, the other way to do it is was to bring to the code, meaning smart contracts, um, a, a stable code like Tether, for example, that is there. And actually, that, that was the, the key aspect that uh, once we understood that it's not that difficult to understand Tether, we didn't like the solution of Tether. Um, so we thought that we could do much more better. And uh, uh, this is the, where where it gets, things get interesting. Um, so I will explain the rationale behind uh, what went onto our minds uh, at that time. We're talking about uh, 2019, beginning, end of 2019, starting 2019. Um, and uh, so, so let's start, Let, let's go deep. Um, I don't know how long this recording is going to be, for, but probably will take a couple hours. Anyways, um, so I will not rush myself um, because this is pretty, pretty important. Um, so what I want to do is, um, well, for this one, first of all, before I start, I want to um, give you a book that if you want to understand much more, is this one called Crypto Assets, Innovative Investor's Guide to Bitcoin and Beyond. Um, it's a very, very uh, good book. Um, here, the, if we go to the uh, first page, um, we will talk about Harry Max Markowitz. Um, he was a winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics and founder of Modern Portfolio Theory. Um, so this is a, a, a very well based book for knowledge, not just for topics up on the table with friends that maybe sometimes are misguided. If you want to understand the history of crypto, um, this is a very, very good source. And um, just going ahead in myself a little bit uh, on what we will talk about in other lectures, uh, lectures uh, the, the solution of the index, the gauge cash index, comes from this part of, of, of economics mathematics, which is, is very deep um, modern portfolio theory. I will explain what is that later. So anyways, for today is just um, a recommendation. So the information that I will be giving today, um, if you want to go deeper, you can buy this book and read it. Uh, I really recommend it, okay. Um, okay, so another thing that I want to do is uh, to get out of the way some misconceptions about uh, Bitcoin. So as we saw here, Bitcoin still is the number one uh, project in terms of market cap. And um, although I love Bitcoin, um, we think that now it should be, it is overvalued, at least from, from uh, a professional point of view valuation. Um, I should, I think that uh, Ethereum should be more valuable by this time, but uh, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that uh, not because I think so, uh, this is the reality. The reality is Bitcoin is still at the top. And this means that still out there, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Bitcoin. Um, 
so people talk about many things. And I want to, although, although this is the paper, you can read it, we will read some parts right now. Um, so I, you can be sure that I am not making anything out uh, and you can trust what I'm saying. Uh, let's let's get some facts right so let's let, let's answer the question what is bitcoin and let's answer the question what is not bitcoin okay um okay so what is bitcoin well you have it there in front of your screen bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system okay um and let's let's read the abstract together because um i guess uh, there are many key aspects that uh, we took note for developing gauge cash that comes from bitcoin so i said again uh, another another thing that i said in the in the last lecture in the first lecture it was that uh gauge cash is the next best thing that has happened after Bitcoin. Um, and today, hopefully, you get the idea of why. So um, some of the problems that Gage Cash solves has been already solved by Bitcoin, OK? But there are other things that Bitcoin couldn't solve that Gage Cash do solve, OK? And it, this is totally normal because the technology uh, has advanced. Remember, Bitcoin was uh, a development done in 2008. Um, was uh, first sent to a, a cryptographic emailing list by uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, although Satoshi Nakamoto is a pseudonym. We don't know exactly who he was. What we do know for sure is um, uh, that the first transaction was done with uh, Paul Finney. I have a, uh, let me, let's move all this up. So here, uh, so, if you look about a uh, whole Fini, uh, you will see right away that Fini created the first reusable proof of work system before Bitcoin. And in January 2009, Fini was a Bitcoin network first transaction recipient. Uh, see, he was part of, of this group, the mailing crypto uh, list. There were about 700 people, most of them computer scientists in the area of uh, California. You can click here and um, uh, sadly, uh, he died, he had a, a disease. But you can, you can read about uh, all Finney uh, in the web, right? Um, so what I what I want to when I what I want to rescue about uh, this topic is that although there has been a lot of thinking about Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, although I cannot say who he is, uh, but for sure he was a very profitable computer scientist, and he understood very well these things because he was the one who programmed it or developed it, right? Implemented the implemented the solution in code. Okay. Um, so let's let's get into the abstract. Um, it says a purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash will allow online payment to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Um, so there you go with the first aspect of what is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, meaning you don't want anyone in the middle, right? Uh, meaning a financial institution. Um, today, uh, 
the world is, uh, if you want to send money uh, through the banking system, uh, which is a big necessity, you need to use um, basically the SWIFT system developed at the US. And if you remember, that was one of the sanctions that the US put over Russia when they invaded Ukraine, right? Um, so is that powerful in the sense that they control the trading of, of the world's first reserve currency, which is the US dollar around the world? So it's obvious, right, hopefully for you, that that is a centralized system and um, is through those central financial institutions that it is uh, done. And another important aspect is that the settlement between banks takes days, right? Um, settlements it will be very important. I will show you how magic uh, uh, blockchain technology work for settlements because settlements are almost instantaneous. In the case of the uh, blockchain that we're using, Polygon is, is, is pretty fast. Uh, really in seconds or less than seconds. Um, so settlements is very is key to import, to, to understand why gauge cash is so valuable. Uh, but that doesn't come from us. That does come from the advancement of blockchain technology in itself. Uh, Polygon is a second layer to blockchain um, that is based on Ethereum. Uh, but I will explain more about that. So um, that that's it in the sense that um, I want just to repeat that uh, what is Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And what does that mean is that you are allowed to send payments directly from one party to another with out going through a financial institution, okay? Um, so let's keep going. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double the spending. Okay, um, this is another big topic, double spending. The double the spending problem is a very, very well-known problem in economics um, and I will explain to you what is a double spending problem so a, a technology that it is used to exchange value um, so I will give you two examples gold is one and another one is paper money, the one that we use today. Uh, take gold out of, in your mind, out of uh, the sensation that it is used for trading because it's valuable. Uh, actually, it's valuable because it's chemical properties. <laughs> Right, not just because it's valuable, meaning that you have a sense that it is beautiful or, no, it's valuable because of its chemical properties for many applications. Uh, that's why it's valuable. So for trading, the properties that make, the, my, that make it suitable for, for that purpose, is um, that it's quite easy to solve the double spending problem. So what is the double spending problem? So um, let's talk now, I'll go back to, to, to dollars, I mean to gold, but let's talk about paper money. So paper money that we use around the world today is, uh, a piece of paper, but that piece of paper has certain characteristics. 
Meaning it's very, very difficult to counterfeit. If it will be very easy to counterfeit, the economy will not work because then you can go out in the store and buy something, say a machine, a printer, and then you can start printing money and then you can go and buy goods and services, right? So the economy will not work if it was very, very easy. So, so basically that is the double spending problem. The double spending problem is like, how do you use something that it is very, very hard to counterfeit and it is very, very easy to check that what you are receiving is not a counterfeit, okay? Um, so let's go back now to gold. Gold, because of its chemical properties, um, since many, many thousands of years, well, not many, many, some thousands, I mean, some thousands years, yeah. Uh, people knew how to check uh, something that in, in chemistry uh, is called, uh, uh, it's a specific weight, okay? So meaning a person that is going to, to, to sell something and he's going to receive gold, he can check very quite easily that that gold is gold. So if they were given to them copper or silver or other kind of metal, by checking its weight and another, sometimes you can check the color and obviously now we have better, better technology. If you go to a pony store, they can check super fast that what you are bringing is gold, <laughs> right? I hope you get the point. I will not get into the deep uh, chemistry properties of gold, but you can check them out. Um, and from the historical point of view, it has been always true that you, that you can check them quite fast. And the second property of gold is that um, this weight, which it's, it's a specific weight, it's very important that um, it doesn't change easily with time, right? Uh, so that's why, for example, people are still uh, in the sea, if there was a ship that uh, uh, sink in the sea, I don't know, I, I, am, I am far from being an expert of pirates and all this kind of stuff, but like for sure there are uh, treasures uh, that has been going down into the sea. Uh, we have the example of the Titanic, right? Well, if there are gold over there, uh, it's quite easy to understand that many things that have were there with all these elements, salt and water and fishes and animals and so on, they get deteriorated, right? But gold maintain its properties. If you take gold out of the sea, uh, it's very likely that uh, nothing ha ha has happened to it. So you can go to the store and sell it. Uh, if this was not true, then gold wouldn't be a good means of trading. Uh, that's why gold for trading is used and is valuable. Plus, it's beautiful. Plus, it's malleable. Plus, it has conducting uh, properties. So, it has many, many good properties that makes it valuable. Uh, but now that we're talking about gold, which we'll talk more about it in, in the lecture about monetary policy and gold standard and all that. Um, gold, uh, in the other hand, it doesn't, I just want to establish this, gold is not, nobody says the value is stable, okay? Uh, I will get into that, meaning stable towards what? Always towards another means of uh, valuing things, meaning, for example, 
the gold US relationship value, or always I, I want to get this in your minds more and more. Is, uh, uh, the best way to talk about value is always towards uh, its purchase power. Okay. So nobody says that gold is stable over the years, but it's purchase power. So th this is a very, very deep, abstract economic um, uh, principle that um, gauge cash solves deeply, okay? Um, so we will, we will explain more about that, but, uh, okay. So, um, hopefully you get by now, what is the double spending problem? So I just summarize, um, if you want to use a technology to trade money, uh, and you have parties that doesn't trust each other. You need a system that has the property of uh, being very easy to check that it is not counterfeit. So you have solved the problem of double spending problem for that particular technology. Okay. If you trust the other party, meaning let's let's put an example, you go to the store. And when I was a kid, my mother talked to the owner of the little store and then my brother and me we went and buy uh things right like kids like it um and he 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 made or she made a a list of things that we were buying uh popcorns and papitas we say here in mexico chips candies cokes you name it. And he or she made a list, the owner, and then my mom, after, I don't know, 15 days, she came back and paid, right? So she trusted my mom that the lady or the guy was not adding more products, right? That's once. And... Um, uh, that was a way of us getting goods, right? So again, when I talk in the last lecture about um, trading, this is true. This probably is a way that always uh, exchanging goods and services has worked with, with a note, whatever is a paper note, right? But if this lady lost their note or somebody threw it to the garbage or so they burn it, then it will be very difficult to know what we got, right? Um, so they need to keep safe these notes, okay? And in that sense, gold is a better system for that. And now this is an example when you trust the other person. When you don't trust it, then uh, you need something that uh, both can trust. And in this case, gold is a, a good technology. Silver is a good, good one as well, although it's not as durable. And um, then there are other methods that are pretty bad for the purpose, okay? Um, so uh, hopefully you grasp the idea that um, the important point here is not what you use, is the property that needs to have. Uh, so Bitcoin solved this problem that it was very, very hard to do, the double the spending problem very, very well established. We will talk more about uh, Bitcoin in that sense. So uh, here we go, right? We propose a solution to the double the spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. The, net, the network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing change of hash-based proof-of-work, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof-of-work. 
the longest change not only serves as proof of the se sequence of, event of events witnessed, but prove that this came from the largest pool of CPU power. As long as a majority of CPU power is controlled by nodes that are not cooperating to attack the network, they'll generate the longest change and outpace attackers. The network itself requires minimal structure. Messages are broadcast on a best on a best effort basis, and nodes can leave and rejoin the, the network at will, accepting the longest proof of work chain as a proof of what happened while they were gone. Um, so let's separate this, this, the abstract in two parts, right? Um, I just explained the general, uh, uh, vision of what Bitcoin is and what problem needed to solve. The second part, the one that I just read is the summary of how technically they do it, they did it, right? Um, so now it will get technical, right? Um, I will not explain the whole thing. Um, because it's not the purpose of the lectures. I just want to give you a sense of uh, what it means in general. And um, probably I'll do another lecture just in the technology, okay? Um, because to understand gauge cache, we need to understand some, some deeper aspects of um, Bitcoin technology that after it came named blockchain te technology, okay? But for today, uh, I will just go pretty fast uh, just to uh, review another parts of the paper, okay? Uh, so as you see, another highlight that I want to mention is he never mentioned here blockchain at all. Um, that was a name that uh, it came later adopted by the industry because of how the structures of um, this ongoing change using hash-based proof of work work. Um, and it, it formed a blockchain, right? Um, so, okay, let's, let's um, dive a little bit uh, deeper. So, um, Here is the introduction. Uh, so I would like to, to read the introduction as well um, and highlight some of its uh, aspects. Um, and then I want to talk about, um, well, let me talk first about um, something that I believe is not mentioned in the introduction, but it will come handy is that um, uh, Bitcoin um, was a solution for a very, very well-known problem in computer science. Uh, it was called the Byzantine general problem, okay? And basically, this paper, which for me deserves a Nobel Prize in economics, uh, solved that problem that was very, very well known for 30 years between cryptographers. Remember, cryptography is a branch of mathematics. Uh, computer science is its own science, right? Uh, but it's very, very well based. I'm sorry, it's based a lot in in mathematics, in mathematics and logic and other things. And this uh, general Byzantine problem uh, was a a problem that was out there, and nobody could solve it for many, many years. 
Uh, so this was the solution, not just the solution in terms of developing the code. There were other attempts back in the 90s that were not successful. Um, but Bitcoin became the one that was implemented and then became successful. Uh, the tricky part is the concept of proof of work, which is quite complex. Um, but uh, why am I saying that it was a very well known problem? Uh, because people that think that Bitcoin is an experiment, uh, they, they are quite wrong, okay? <laughs> Now Bitcoin has been out there for more than a decade. And the science behind it is, is quite outstanding. So it's at the level of the best science done in, in, in many other fields. Uh, that's why I believe I did this, this paper deserves a, a Nobel Prize. Um, Let's read the intro and um, then I'll go through the paper uh, more lightly, I'm sorry, more faster, and then uh, we'll keep going, okay? So uh, here, what I, what I want to highlight is the applications of Bitcoin, which um, to advance of what is going to be the conclusion of this part is, um, this was the promise of Bitcoin, and there's a problem, basically two problems with the solution um, that uh, became later uh, well established, although these guys, uh, Holtini, Satoshi Nakamoto, and the other ones knew, because they designed the system that way. Um, and we will touch in the topic of volatility or price stability. So what I'm saying is it was, as you can, you will see here, it was not the purpose of Bitcoin to solve the Byzantine general problem, which solves the double spending problem with the use of these techniques of proof of work and cryptography and hashing and so on. Plus, stability of prices. Uh, this has with the insurance, this has to do with the insurance model of Bitcoin. Um, and that is very important because the insurance model of Bitcoin, which I, uh, I'll explain today, uh, has made Bitcoin uh, susceptible to a lot of speculation. Although in reality, it's quite easy to understand the behavior of the volatility of Bitcoin, but nobody says that um, that means that is not a problem. It is a problem for large adoption. Um, and Bitcoin was not designed in, in that sense for, for solving that problem. So uh, although it's a tool, for what we are going to read right now, uh, price stability is a huge, huge problem of Bitcoin. And what I want to say very emphatically is Satoshi Nakamoto didn't pretend to solve that problem. It was good enough to solve the other problems that has never been solved again for many, many years. Um, but that problem of volatility makes impossible for Bitcoin to be adopted largely, okay? Although I will give you uh, a very, very interesting fact about Bitcoin that demonstrate that these guys knew about economics a lot, okay? Actually, there's a couple of anecdotes um, that are pretty cool to see about Bitcoin. So let's go ahead and read this part. Commerce on the internet has come to rely almost exclusively 
on financial institutions serving as trusted third parties to process electronic payments. Let me just check something. Quick. While the system works well enough for most transactions, it still suffers from the inherent weaknesses of the trust-based model. Completely non-reversible transactions are not really possible since financial institutions cannot avoid mediating disputes. The cost of mediating, mediation increases transaction costs, limiting the minimum practical transaction size and cutting off the possibility for small casual transactions. And there is a broader cost in the loss of ability to make non-reversible payments for non-reversible services. With the possibility of reversal, the need for trust spreads. Merchants must be wary of their customers, hassling, hassling them for more information that they will otherwise need. A certain percentage of fraud is accepted as unavoidable. These costs and payments or uncertain things can be avoided in person by using physical currency, but no mechanism exists to make payments over a communication channel without a trusted party. What is needed is an electronic payment system based on cryptographic proof instead of trust, allowing any two willing parties to transact directly with each other without the need of a trusted third party. Transactions that are computationally impractical to reverse will protect sellers from fraud. And routine escrow mechanism could easily be implemented to protect buyers. In this paper, we propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer distributed timestamp server to generate computational proof of the chronological order of transactions. This system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attackers know. Okay, so um, um, well, uh, always that I read uh, this paper uh it gets me uh, excited in, in the sense that it's pretty cool to to see what um, these guys were were trying to do and that not just trying but they accomplish with very very cool science um okay so here uh there are other aspects um that are quite deep uh, because uh, this last sentence, the, the system is secure as long as honest nodes collectively control more CPU power than any cooperating group of attackers nodes. Um, that's basically an implementation of what is called game theory. Game theory is another branch of mathematics um, that has been used in in economics a lot, it was developed by a mathematician known as John Nash. There's a movie about him done by uh, Russell, the actor. I am very bad with names, uh, Russell Crowe. And um, John Nash suffered from uh, schizophrenia. Well, uh, if you want to watch the movie, it's a very good one. To go for it. Um, and the ideas of um, John Nash came from another great, great mathematician called, uh, or his last name was Von Van Neumann, if I am not mistaken. Um, so there's a lot in this paper that is, is not written. Um, so as always, these are professional people, meaning doctors in computer science. So the paper is for professional people um, that understand many, many other aspects of, or you, they have a lot of knowledge. So they don't take the time to, to explain every part because if not, it would become a book, right? Um, so, uh, I just want to highlight that part because game theory is very important to understand blockchain or the consensus mechanism of proof of work, which I said is not easy uh, because you need to understand all these things. But anyways, uh, so here he, um, he starts explaining directly what is uh, 
the technical part, right? Um, uh, I will skip this. There is um, uh, an explanation of, of like a very, very well written paper, uh, like the good ones. Uh, remember I mentioned to you, sorry that I, uh, I just want to make a comment. Um, uh, is is very interesting that um, when I study physics, um, none of my professors never, so they go by textbooks, modern textbooks, right? And at least in my experience, uh, they never took me to the papers of the people that um, uh, made uh, big uh, changes to the knowledge of um, our understanding. Uh, for example, the paper of um, uh, special relativity of Einstein in 1905. And what I learned, what I what I learned of not going through the through the main source, meaning in this case the Einstein paper, is you lose a lot of uh, context. So um, that's why I encourage you to um, go through the sources, right? Um, I can tell you that the idea of gauge cash. Um, was, I mean, there's other people that has thought uh, to do something like that, uh, including Vitalik Buterin, the founder of um, Ethereum, right? He mentioned that it would be cool to have something like gauge cash. <laughs> uh, I will go through, through that later. I mean, not today, but like in another yeah. lecture. So uh, the inspiration of how, so basically what I'm saying, he proposed the problem. Again, just like here, these guys knew the problem, the, how to solve the general Byzantine problem. So Vitalik, in his paper, he realized that there could be a way to make a decentralized, stable peer-to-peer -peer cash system using your only blockchain tech. Right, and its economic properties. So we took that inspiration of acknowledging that uh, the set of questions were there because now there were the possibility of solving them. Okay. Uh, so this repeats a lot in history. Um, um, so in the case of, um, I am very ashamed that in the case of my teachers never uh, taught us to go through the, through the papers um, to get real knowledge, right? Um, anyway, um, here are the rules in this part of the network. Uh, well, I will make uh, just again, sorry, because I take you a little bit out of track. So, um, here is here is how transactions are defined and work. Uh, here is how um, uh, the blocks are constructed using the cryptographic techniques. Um, proof of work, remember, uh, was developed by uh, Hall Finney in two thousand and four. So. Um, to create the blockchain, in this case, Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, this is how they done it. The network, these are the rules for the network to participate. Um, and incentive. So here is the part of game theory, which is pretty cool to see. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about incentives. Um, blockchain technology. So the point on the point that I want to highlight here is um, game theory. As I said, is a branch of mathematics and studies the way in which um, 
people could behave in, in, in certain situations, or I don't know, I am not an expert in game theory, but like, I don't know how many applications does it have in terms of, if I can say many situations. Um, but um, you can establish some games, meaning what is convenient to do. Um, so the concept that I want to highlight here is um, just a very, very simple, simple one, just to give you an idea of, of game theory, right? Um, and the example that I'm going to give is true for the consensus mechanism of Bitcoin and not just Bitcoin, but other projects like Ethereum, for example, Polygon, um, Avalanche, um, um, Solana, Polkadot, although they use different consensus mechanisms, um, proof of work, proof of stake, proof of history with different cryptography. But the idea or the principle behind it for blockchain application is more or less the same, okay? And is this one. So, um, Suppose I tell you, hey, let's go rob a bank, okay? And uh, the purpose of robbing a bank is to get money out of it, right? Uh, nobody can argue that. And you say, okay, let's do it. Let's rob a bank. So the obvious question to ask is how much are we going to rob, right? Because uh, if you tell me just one dollar, then <laughs> I am not very incentivized to do so. On the other hand, I can tell you, well, we are going to rob 10 million US dollars, okay? And then you, you tell me, okay, perfect. That sounds great. Uh, how many people and resources do we know? Uh, how many resources do we need to to steal uh, this 10 million US dollar. And I give you this answer. Well, we need 15 million US dollar. <laughs> well, you're going to come back to me and say, Manuel, are you stupid or what? <laughs> you want to rob 10 and then it is going to cost us 15, right? Uh, so again, you're not incentivized. Uh, well, that, that's game theory. So the, the game theory, what's, what's the story is, okay, what incentivize people to act honestly, right? Or not? And if there is a mathematical modeling of that behavior, and that was what John Nash developed. John Nash developed a mathematical model for uh, measure the incentives of people to do certain things or many things. Uh, so here we will see at the end of the paper, we can calculate the probability of a person saying, okay, we want to steal, and I will explain a little bit what is a steal uh, or hack the Bitcoin blockchain, okay? Uh, if it is worthy to try to do that. An important part is that now for the first time in history, there was a, there's an economic layer. This is true for Ethereum and this is very important for Ethereum that I want to highlight. For the first time, there's money involved in which is the same question that I just gave you with the example about banking, right? So if I am going to try to commit a hack into the system, it's better that I get more of what I'm going to put in resources, right? I made, hopefully I made that obvious. Well, uh, that's why Bitcoin is very, very, very hard or very, very unlikely to um, be hacked 
or in another words, to be robbed. Uh, it's quite complicated to do and you need a lot, a lot of money, probably more money of what you will get. So that's why people cannot do it. Okay. And it will be good for me to say right now that um, it's different the hacks of what happened with the exchanges that we will talk about that of Bitcoin. Those have been hacked, right? Um, or they have committed fraud, for example, FTX or, um, I mean, th there are other examples. Um, I was thinking of Mr. Gox, um, the largest exchange in 2013. It didn't get hacked, um, but um, they were trading drugs and stuff. It was not the problem of the exchange. It was the problem of uh, just letting people do whatever they want. That's another problem. And that brought bad media into Bitcoin. Bitcoin has nothing to do with that. Uh, so people... <laughs> It's like having cash, right? People can buy whatever they want. If they want to buy drugs, then they can do it. I mean, they can do it in the sense that if they are not, if, if they are doing it illegally and they are caught by the police, then they will be responsible of some felony and they can go to whatever uh, uh, punishment they will get. But anyways, Hopefully uh, you understand me in the sense that uh, that's another problem. Uh, what we're talking here, and it's very important that you catch up, is that Bitcoin is very, very unlikely that it is hacked. Okay, and as more time passes, uh, uh, becomes even harder. Um. So there, there's many other things that come to my mind that I can tell you, but um, I will stop here because if not, I will not end the never. Um, so um, we will get into this a little bit more uh, meaning game theory. Um, reclaiming this space, um, this is, a, again, this is just a technique um, uh, for nodes. Um, they use some something that is called Merkle trees. Um, again, technique in computer science based on logic, mathematics. Uh, so that um, basically you can download the blockchain. And I mean, this, this is important because um, for, for the purpose of, of, of gauge cash, uh, it's not important to understand the technique. What is important to grasp is another principle, uh, which is like anyone in the world can download the blockchains, meaning Ethereum blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain, or other blockchains into their computers. So uh, that is a valuable asset in itself. So hopefully you understand why. Uh, remember if... Uh, Remember I talked about in the last lecture about the protocol of the internet, HTTP. So the idea there was that um, they were thinking in war, right? What happens if a database, central database is hit or controlled by an enemy, right? And then, uh, or directly damaged by an enemy. Um, let, let's, I will make this out a little bit, but it's not far from history in the sense that, uh, let's, let's talk about the Pentagon. Uh, so imagine all the information of the US is there, physically there, right? Uh, what happened in 2001, in 11th of September, uh, and the whole Pentagon is destroyed, so the old information of valuable information that the U.S. possesses is destroyed. So uh, in war times, people thought about that problem of centralized uh, information. So the way to solve it, to solve it uh, is with distributed systems. So you, you have copies. 
And, uh, but you need to connect those systems, right? Or those databases. So um, that's why you needed a protocol. Basically, you can access for a everywhere uh, those databases. So that that's the origin of the internet. And it has many, many applications, of course. We know that after 50 years, 60 years now of usage. And it is, is, is very useful, right, in that sense. Uh, has worked pretty well. Uh, it's very, very hard. Uh, I was in the last time to take down the internet. Probably human race will be down first before the internet in itself as a distributed system. So uh, these techniques um, of you, meaning anyone downloading a copy of Bitcoin, it means, what it means is that you can rescue the information of what has been done in the network for many years. And so remember when we talk about the copy of, if I go to the store, if anyone loses the copy, then how do you know who owns what, right? Uh, or why my mother, how how much money my mother uh, owns to the owner of the shop. Uh, well, these techniques allow that anyone can has a copy. So that's what that's why it makes it a very robust system. Uh, and it's open source. Open source meaning you can run it, you can participate, or you can save it. Okay. So again, this is very important because uh, this is not um, an exchange thing. This is not the job of Binance, although I don't know if they run notes or, but anyone can do it. I mean, you need to know a little bit of computer science for sure. But uh, I will, this is, a, this is a key aspect for understanding the value of the backing up of gauge cash, which is a true disruption of our project. Meaning, hopefully this come by easier and easier as the lectures uh, advances. There's an infrastructure of knowledge and information that is openly distributed without normal citizens in which for the first time in history we can put we can put an inherit or i'm not saying this right this system has an inherit economic layer and anyone can put this information in their hands basically they can become keepers or savers of this information Okay, and that is very, very valuable. Actually, we can use that property for putting the value of the world in that piece of information. I will explain more about that when we get to the to the lecture in which in which we explain how uh, we're backing up. Uh, gauge cash in the abstract way, which is not that abstract in the sense that it is real, um, is in the blockchain class in itself. And when I said blockchain class in itself is this property of information being recorded in many, many or thousands of computers around the world that because of that, that infor information can stay alive for many generations in the future, okay? This hasn't been, um, and, and, the, and the difference with, with, with internet is that this one, blockchain technology, again, has an inherent economic layer in itself. 
the HTTP protocol, it doesn't have a, a layer of economic incentives. Blockchain, in this case, that we're talking about Bitcoin with um, capital B, that's the blockchain, with uh, the normal B or the minus B is the coin or, or the digital coin, like B with capital B is a blockchain. The blockchain in itself, it's information that you can store, anyone can store. And that property, remember we talk about gold properties for exchanging value and so on, is super important. So we can all keep track of what's going, what's going on, okay? Um, finally, um, uh, this is uh, just uh, uh, the implementation of uh, efficiency in the system. Uh, it says it is impossible. It is possible to verify payments without running a full network node. That's what I'm saying. Uh, you can check that all the transactions are happening. You don't need to be participant as a whole node, meaning a miner. That's the word. Uh, you can just store the information that is needed to verify that, the, let's say, if you own Bitcoin, you can have your copy of Bitcoin and then you can access and see that everything is, is um, working properly. Okay. Um, this is more information um, about the techniques they use. Um, privacy. Okay, um, this was one of the purposes, right, um, of Bitcoin and this group of um, something that I didn't mention is that these guys, these computer science, they pertain a group that they call themselves cyberpunks, right? Um, and they were worried about privacy. Uh, remember, privacy has been a topic that has... Um, was addressed by regulation, I mean, regula regulatory entities in the last, I don't know, what, six, maybe you know better than me, like six, seven years. Um, now that you enter into any website, you get these pop-ups with, do you accept cookies and privacy and so on and so forth. Um, so, all, always, um, there is a very interesting topic here about privacy um, uh, that I want to touch um, because uh, we are facing now with exchanges, for example, the the money money laundry problem. Uh, so I just want to say that uh, all the tools of money laundry they mainly affect the average people that actually is not doing that. Uh, and the people who is doing it, it's very hardly affected because of corruption, right? Um, so I can tell you for sure, I mean, uh, I will not throw myself into the wolves, but like uh, I can tell you for sure, uh, because I work, I have worked in the industry, that uh, money laundering happens all the time at the highest level. Um, so uh, that's why these guys, although I am not a cyberpunk or anything like that, uh, but I understand where, where they come from. And um, in a sense, I agree that uh, you should be able to spend your money, I mean, after, you pay taxes or whatever you need to do legally in your country or that you feel that like you need to do to be responsible as a citizen, then your money is your money, right? You can do whatever with it. Um, so privacy is an important aspect of it and it's pretty cool that um, it is respected in, in this uh, uh, systems. Uh, and actually, um, I just want to mention that 
Bitcoin, um, it can be tracked somehow. So meaning, um, now I am going away a little bit for the main topic, but like uh, just to mention, so you know, um, Bitcoin blockchain, if you are smart enough and with the right techniques, you can track, right? And because at the end it's a public network. So you can know, meaning not exactly the person or maybe you can track the person with, uh, again, using, not, not that I know, <laughs> meaning using, so basically what I want to say is for sure you can track what private key owns what, right? So like, if you want to know who are the largest uh, or most private, the private keys that have more Bitcoin that is public. Now, can you link the private key to a person or a company or a font or whatever? That is more difficult. You, you will need to connect dots. Um, but uh, there were there were people that wanted to um, uh, work in something that is called um, zero knowledge proof uh, techniques. I mean, they are well established. Probably you don't know about that, but like um, uh, Z Zcash, uh, which was then a, another project. Uh, that you can use for the same as Bitcoin. They use this technique. So what I mean, just want to say is that in that blockchain, the purpose is that uh, there's no way you can track the same private key with the amount of money. So um, because they basically take three or four keys, imagine, I mean, I will simplify, but they, they take four, in the process, they take like four private keys and they put it in in the hive and they just take out one private key that is not equal to the one that entered the transaction and they keep going. But, but the system tracks it, but hide, hide it, uh, hides it, the, the private key. So it's changing all the time. So it's impossible to track. Although it's public, <laughs> but you, you will have all the time different keys. So um, those techniques are used in Ethereum as well. For for example, uh, in 2019, when I was in a developer's conference, um, I don't know, companies like Deloitte, um, not all the information that they have, if they want to use uh, a public blockchain like Ethereum, um, they want to share it, right? Um, to the general public. So they use techniques like that to hide information. When we talk about the theme, uh, I'll talk about that, okay? Um, uh, and this is the part um, of safety, okay? Uh, but I love that uh, Satoshi put uh, calculations, right, um, as the title. Uh, so let's just read a, a little bit about this. <clears throat> it says, we consider this scenario of an attacker trying to generate an alternate chain up faster than the honest chain. So again, this is a part of the calculation of game theory. Meaning, uh, if you read this part, it's like, um, what are, so the question is, the question that I told you about the bank, right? Uh, he's trying to answer uh, or calculate um, so uh, what, what will be the cost to attack the network, okay? Um, and the answer is, is with mathematics. Um, so uh, I just read this part just because I like it. <laughs> the, race, the race between the honest change and attacker chain can be characterized as a binomial random walk. Um, and then he established the model. So basically this is the mathematical model. And then uh, he cal calculates the probabilities and then he runs the probabilities and he gives the results here. 
um, says running some results, we can see the probability drop exponentially with C. Okay, so um, uh, I will not explain this deeply, but that you can see um, the probability is um, very, very low, okay? Um, um, less than one, 0.1%. So uh, again, the incentive, so so basically, in, in other words, let's translate this mathematics into the real world or with a real example. Um, remember, uh, I told you, okay, I, I tell you, okay, let, let's rob a bank, right? And uh, you tell me, um, well, how much is going to cost us? And remember the price was 10 million, right? And you tell me, uh, I tell you, the resources that we need is 15 million. So we will have 5 million of, of US dollars in losses. But you, you are very rich, right? And you tell me, well, I want to do it for fun. <laughs> that can happen, okay? Um, it will not very uh, likely to happen, but the, I mean, always a very set percentage of probability, it, things can happen, right? So, but it's just like, in, I like always to say, uh, I said it in the last lecture, like if gauge cash can fail and the answer is yes, you can never talk in absolute terms. There's always a probability of things that can go wrong. Um, so in this case, here are the computation in the case of blockchain, which I love. It shows transparency and maturity, of course, from people that uh, understand the, these things very, very well, right? Um, uh, but in the case of Bitcoin, now this, I mean, I haven't made the calculations, you can do it. Like um, probably I can tell you for sure that uh, the losses of, having fun attacking Bitcoin can be in the, in, in, it, 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 it could cost trillions at this time, right? Just because the valuation of Bitcoin is half trillion um, to outrun all the honest um, miners will be in the, in the size of trillions. So, Although you wanted to do it for fun, there is not too much people that have trillions, right? Not even countries. So uh, that's why it's very, very unlikely that that happened in the real world, okay? Uh, so let's read the conclusion. Um, we have proposed a system for electronic transactions without relying on trust. This is true for gauge cash. We started with the unusual framework of coins made from digital signatures, which provides strong control of ownership. This is true for gauge cash, but it's incomplete without a way to prevent double spending. So that's, remember, that was the whole purpose of Bitcoin, to solve the problem of the Byzantine general problem, which is the double spending problem. Um, to solve this, we propose a peer-to-peer -peer network using proof of work to record the public history of transactions that quickly becomes computationally impractical for an attacker to change if honest nodes control the majority of CPU power. The network is robust and it's uh, on structure simplicity. Nodes work all at once with little coordination. They do not need to be identified since mess messages are not routed to any particular place and only need to be delivered on a best effort basis, meaning this has to do with privacy, efficiency, and so on. Nodes can leave and rejoin the network at will, accepting the proof of work chain as proof of what leave, I mean, what happened while they, they were gone. Um, they vote with their CPO power, expressing their acceptance of valid blocks by working on extending them and rejecting valid blocks by refusing to work on them, any new rules and incentives can be enforced with this consensus mechanism. So um, that's it. Um, that is the paper. And uh, some things that are not stated in the paper, uh, but if you go through the code, you can see 
Um, so let me let me go uh, about those aspects, uh, which are important for for Gage Cashel. Uh, let me just change here my my screen, and I will come back in a second. Well, let's continue. Now, what we'll do is, now that we review the white paper of um, Bitcoin, um, well, um, just to say something about um, the world white paper, I don't know where that comes from. Um, I haven't researched that, so if someone of you knows, let me know. Um, but uh, the thing that I know is that papers uh, in the science world, um, there there has been some remarkable papers, right? As I as I alluded to, the special relativity, nineteen oh five, general relativity. I mean thousands of, of Nobel Prize winning papers and so on. So um, in reality, uh, an opinion that I have about the fashion of crypto, which is kind of stupid for me, is that after this white paper was released by, 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 by Bitcoin, um, in reality, it's a paper, right? It, a paper probably, I don't know if it, has, it was called white paper because it was not sent to a um, to, to be published or to the arcade or something in the academy. Although I, I, I believe it belongs there, as I said, and probably <laughs> deserves a Nobel Prize. But anyways, uh, that's your that was my, my opinion. So what I mean is... Um, the word white paper then in the crypto world became just used like uh, for stupid projects just saying, oh, you need a white paper, white paper and so on and this and that, right? So we did it, we did our own white paper, but um, just to clarify in, in the Gage Cash white paper, uh, is not a paper in the sense of uh, an academic paper. Uh, but we don't want to break all the rules in the sense that people, if they want a white paper, well, uh, what it means to us is an explanation of what uh, Gage Cash is all about, okay? Um, but uh, because I consider myself a, a respectful academy uh, admire of great papers. Um, the Bitcoin paper uh, is a great one. Hopefully in the future um, uh, we can write or I have been sketch a real paper of Gage Cash in the sense of uh, academic rigor. Uh, but what is published in our website it's just the general idea. Probably these lectures uh, can be regarded more as a rigorous paper in terms of information of what the gauge cache is, right? Um, so I want to be respectful for other projects that deserves those honors and um, get away ourselves from the passion of just uh, even firms saying that uh, they make you your white paper for some mm -hmm. X or Y, Z um, non-valuable project. Anyways, let's continue. Um, so we need to address something that um, it was not said in the paper, Bitcoin's paper, but it's very, very important for Gage Cash, which is um, um, token economics. Um, um, again, this world 
this uh, sentence or set of words, token economics, has been used lately by crypto projects. Uh, uh, again, my opinion in a very stupid way um, that has to do more with um, how are the tokens are going to be released or so, like if they were, I don't know, there are many issues there. Um, if you think of them as, as, as a securities, uh, they are treated sometimes like securities and uh, they smell like securities and that's, that's a big problem with regulation. Um, so, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't want them to put in examples of why I, despite a little bit uh, how token ex economics, the word has been used. Again, you saw in the paper, is not even mentioned. Um, so I'm just using this for, because in reality, there are some, um, well, let, let me correct myself um, here now that I'm thinking of that. Um, Let's not go by this, so I don't like it. Let's go by Bitcoin. Bitcoin economics. That's much more better. Okay. Sorry, I didn't plan this, but um, I said I was going to take my time, so I'm doing that. Um, Bitcoin economics, much, much, more, much more accurate and, and better and respectful for this amazing project. <laughs> Um, the other one will be, um, uh, specifically, specifically, or more precisely, um, the Shuan's model of Bitcoin. Shuan's model. Uh, and other aspect that I want to talk about is exchanging Bitcoin. Exchanging no. Forgive me if again I make my mistake. Remember, uh, uh, English is my second language, so forgive me for the mistakes. I don't want to put too much attention to them. So let me just real quick exchange this. Exchange. Exchange. Okay, sorry. Anyways, um, exchanging Bitcoin. I want to talk about that. Um, so let's let's start with some facts again. Um, some facts. Um, I will not explain right now. Uh, how Bitcoin was released in the sense of uh, nodes uh, doing the proof of work job when Bitcoin started. Um, I will just, I mean, you can again go through this in, I don't know, in the internet or if you want to research more. But uh, it was in a pace of um, 50 Bitcoin per for every 10 minutes over five years. And then uh, that was divided in 25. And then after five years, 20, uh, divided by two again. So um, so I will give you just the started uh, 50 BTC. If I'm correct, it's for five years. And then it will go in a rate for 50 divided by two five years, and so on. Um, so by now, uh, most of Bitcoin, so, so the total here is uh, 21 million. So what I want to, to rescue is that it is a finite issuance model. And by definition, again, by definition means 
is like that by definition. Um, um, I mean, if you are not familiar with mathematics, in mathematics, we use a lot definitions, right? So it's the starting point. So there is no questions behind that. So you cannot, you cannot ask why, right? So by definition means um, it has this property of meaning of uh, a set up, a set of, a set of, not set up, sorry, set of just a total amount of coins out there, 21 million. It is pretty close. If we go to coin market cap again, in circulation, I believe right now there are 19 million. It will take um, more more years to to get to the twenty one million, but like we can approximate the whole thing that it is pretty close to be all what Bitcoin is going to be. Uh, the total supply is is almost already out. So for our purposes and approximating values, uh, let's let's take twenty twenty million, okay? Which is pretty close of. Of, of what is happening right now. So um, here, uh, we will we will make some couple calculations so you have an idea of what's going on. Um, but I want to explain um, uh, the decision that. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto took about the issuance model. This issuance model is not by chance. Um, again, again um, these guys were pretty, pretty smart and they knew what they, they were doing. Uh, so remember that we are going to talk about uh, monetary systems. Um, and not just monetary systems, but um, one way of giving something value uh, in monetary systems is, um, remember I told you that there's a range from hard monetary systems to um, uh, open markets monetary systems. So um, let me just check here one thing. So open monetary system means um, whatever the market decides uh, that the good or service is value, it is what it is. That's the that's the value. Okay. Um, so. If there is built a scarcity on the insurance model, then it's easier that by demand of a scarce good or service, uh, the value can go up. So that was the logic behind the insurance, the finite insurance model of Bitcoin. Um, I am I am sorry for being so slow right now in my talking. But uh, I want to make sure that um, I am being uh, I am being understood because people get this part till this day after almost 15 years of the development of Bitcoin wrong. Okay. So People, uh, I have been talking even to professional finance people, and they say the value of Bitcoin is uh, based on nothing. Uh, and that is totally wrong. <laughs> okay, again, when somebody says that the value of Bitcoin is not based in anything, is wrong. You are wrong. So what is the correct answer? 
Well, it is based on the laws, laws of supply and demand. Those, it's a law that exists and you encounter that every day in single transaction that you do with value or in which you are transacting value, okay? Um, so this is economics 101, macroeconomics 101, microeconomics 101, I mean, so basic, okay? Uh, but people like to give this esoteric uh, sometimes, I believe, um, like if this topic was so deep in terms of, of, of Bitcoin. So again, um, there's many, many examples. So I will put you, I remember you, uh, I told you that I like cars. So uh, all cars, um, uh, if you go to the, to the dealership, you buy a new car, you go out and it automatically is de devaluated by some percentage. Usually it's 10, 10 to 20 percent of just getting it out of the dealership. But there are some cars that they hold their value of they go up in that value. How that can happen if all the other ones, even new ones, they lost value? And the answer is very, very simple. One way is that there is more demand than supply. But the other way is that you build the scarcity, meaning the supply scarcity in, 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 in the car. So if there is demand, always that is the condition, but if there is just certain amount of cars out there, for example, Ferrari, La Ferrari, or uh, Porsche, Porsche 918 or McLaren P1 or Formula One used by Schumacher in 2002, let's say, there are just two alive. And there are 100 people that want that car and they go to an auction. The price will go up for sure, okay? So again, with this, I mean, and just to put another example that has not, anything to do with cars. Um, let's talk about um, this uh, economics or laws are used a lot by, uh, in the case of women and listening to these uh, uh, recordings in the, in the luxury industry, uh, this technique is just a lot, a lot in the sense of um, uh, special editions. Okay, so special editions that they have that purpose. If you have an, a special edition, it means that there are just going to be certain amount of watches, bags, uh, this and that, uh, artist, uh, Louis Vuitton bag in collaboration with certain artists, so they just make 300 bucks or a thousand bucks or five bucks. And they become special. If there, again, if there is demand for, for it. Another example just to end is, uh, let's say clothes or jewelry used by uh, famous people, singers. I don't know if you have been to any of the hard rock hotels, they have plenty guitars or whatever. It's not the same a guitar, a nice guitar, a Stratocaster or a glove or a piece of jewelry that is for the general public. It's different if Michael Jackson use it, right? Uh, and it is for sale and people demand it because Michael Jackson use it and there's just one or two or whatever. I mean, a finite number, the price can go on recent on reasonable high because it has another kind of value okay but the point that i want to make here is uh if you if you ask the same the, the same question um the value is based in nothing you're making a mistake the value is based on the laws of supply and demand right 
So there is this thing that there are just a certain amount of them, sometimes just one piece, and there is demand for it. So the price goes up, that's it. Okay, but again, very basic economics. Um, so let me, let me, um, so let, let me just uh, uh, put down some uh, graphs of that. So again, we get out uh, this concept out of our way in the sense that it's not mystical or anything like that. It's pretty simple. And um, I can explain a little bit uh, more about that, okay? Okay, so let's frame um, this principle of, uh, so we have Bitcoin with a scarce issuance model, 21 million. And remember Bitcoin is a service, is a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. What's the service? That you don't need a centralized entity to send value. Um, and that you can be sure that uh, that technology, just like gold, paper, cash, and now Bitcoin, it solves the double spending problem by a network of miners, nodes, and so on. Uh, so when you send Bitcoin, you can be sure that there are no other Bitcoin repeated. So the economics of the double spending problem cannot be. Uh, so. Sorry, basically there's no, cannot be counterfeit of Bitcoin within the network. So that means if you get one Bitcoin, there's no other repeatable Bitcoin in the network. Uh, and now you can see why a finite insurance model is key uh, to do the balance sheet of that. Uh, probably a counters will be uh, acquainted with these uh, systems, right? Uh, to check that the accounts are done correctly. Okay. Um, but I will not, not get into account ability because I don't like it. <laughs> Plus you do your, your own research, but it's pretty easy. Anyways, um, so let's, let's translate. So, um, we have a service. If people demand this service, then the price, because there's a scarcity in the system, will go up. Okay. Uh, and now let me show you how uh, from the economic economics point of view uh, this looks like, right? So um you can make a graph like this and you can put the price here and you can put the um, supply here. So in the case of Bitcoin, the supply is fixed. So you write a line like this and then um, when there is changes in demand, um, you write, uh, I mean, yeah, you write a line like, like this. Okay. Um, and then you can establish the price here. Okay. So let's write another demand line here. Okay. So if the demand goes to here, this is demand, then the supply is fixed. And then the price goes up, okay? There you go. So you have price one here and price two here. 
The same happened the other way around. If the uh, demand goes from here to here, you have this point from here to here. Now the price will go down. Okay. Uh, this is called uh, the graph of a inelastic good or service. Inelastic means that uh, there is no way to change the supply. Um, so here, what uh, the concept that I want to, to highlight is um, in economics, it's well known that a uh, service or good that has an inelastic supply cure, um, then it becomes uh, more volatile. So um, let's uh, let's write this like this: volatile. Bo that tile. So, um, inelastic good or service versus elastic. Inelastic, inelastic is always much more volatile than elastic. Okay. Um, that's just how economics behave. Um, I will not explain right now the curves of uh, elastic uh, goods or services. Um, but I mean, if you want to think about something that happened uh, recently when the pandemic started, um, there was certain number of masks out there, right? And people start needing masks. So the supply um, was not there. So what, what happened to the prices of the mask? Well, they, 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 everybody knows, right? You needed to pay more. Um, and people take advantage of this. This is an example of an elastic supply. So so other people that maybe they were making other things started to, to produce masks. So there was more supply to the, let's say to the system. So what happened? Uh, the price came down. Well, now let's talk about Ethereum. So I'll write here. Ethereum. And um, the reason for talking about Ethereum is, um, I believe there are no more for the, our interest in, in explaining gauge cash. I believe there should be like three or five characteristics that I want just to highlight. Um, the first, the first of all is um, what is what is Ethereum? Well, uh, very briefly, Ethereum is uh, the world's first decentralized computer. So, um, so let's remember uh, what we just said about Bitcoin. Bitcoin um, is uh, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And Ethereum 
wanted to do uh, the next the next step forward in, in technology um and that has to do with something that in computer science is called a towering complete uh, language So again, uh, in the book that I recommended to you, Crypto Assets, uh, you can read much more about it, but like um, this was in the academia between computer science, um, computer scientists. Uh, again, a very, a very well-established problem. Um, there were some attempts in the 90s to, to solve it. And um, there were some early versions of uh, some of the parts needed to accomplish uh, this. But after the development of Bitcoin and the techniques that Bitcoin used for establishing the participation of a network that uh, incentivized by money, uh, now, uh, the next step was um, going for a technically what is called a Turing complete language. So, in other words, Bitcoin was written, I mean, the code in a, a, a language that is called a script if I am not mistaken, hopefully. Um, but the point is, is that the language is, um, is not designed from the computational point of view so that you can do everything. Uh, what does that mean in computer science is exactly this point. Um, by definition, a Turing complete language is a language in, in which you can do, uh, let's say, all kinds of computations. Um, till this day, just examples of very powerful languages is C, C++. Um, now we have stuff that is um, uh, better or more purposely built like Java, JavaScript, um, and still the development continues. Um, we have Rust, um, I believe now uh, both languages that are used for the development of apps from uh, Apple, Swift, and from Google Go are Turing complete. Um, so again, I'm not expert in the topic, but, um, uh, basically, uh, the idea that we need to grasp here is that if you wanted to program some things in, under the blockchain of Bitcoin, you just can do it. There, there was just certain amount of things you can do. And there was others that just by using another language, you could easily do in, in, a, in a computer, right? In a PC or whatever. Um, but there was a trade between um, these things because uh, Satoshi Nakamoto decided purposely again to use this language and not Turing complete language to make the system safer. So for the purpose of what was Bitcoin, it was not necessary to use a Turing complete language. And that uh, brought security and decentralization and ease of use for the protocol advantages. So, um, 
we we learned that the, the problem that Bitcoin wanted to solve was the double spending problem. And the architecture for that, um, they, de they he decided to use to this uh, a not Turing complete language that make it uh, easier uh, so that the protocol can hold and not uh, be what is called box that uh, doesn't have to do with the purpose of what you are doing. So you don't require to check everything. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm starting to repeat in myself, <laughs> but let's 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 shift a little bit because I am doing that. Uh, just because Ethereum uh, went and accomplished all these problems uh, and make it a successful story. So um, the the story behind Vitalik is quite interesting as well. Um, he was a well accomplished programmer since a very young age. And he was a fan of Bitcoin. Actually, he was the founder of a uh, magazine called Bitcoin. And then in 2013, he decided to, I mean, in 2014, 15, he decided to go and try to solve this problem and build um, uh, a decentralized computer. Um, but they needed to build everything from scratch. So the language that uh, they built was inspired on Java and it was called Solidity. And um, they succeeded. So uh, till this point, uh, Ethereum is the second largest crypto project in the world and for sure is the second disruption in what is we, we have been talking now about distributed systems in computer science, so for sure uh, it's a great achievement. And um, let's uh, understand this. Uh, wh what are the applications? What are the differences from Bitcoin to Ethereum? Well, now with, with Ethereum, you can think of uh, literally I don't know if an infinite or thousands, thousands of millions, I don't know, of applications that you just cannot do with Bitcoin. Uh, because now you have basically a computer at your hand. Um, but there are some caveats. And the caveats are these ones. Not um, for all endeavor, of uh, that we need to use a computer, not necessarily you want to use a decentralized computer, right? Uh, because let's not confuse, for example, iCloud computing, which uh, it means you go in to any, let's call it a hardware computer, and then you access over the internet another computer that is running in a server um, and you can do their computation. Let's, let's, let's put the example of using Microsoft Office. Uh, basically that's decentralizing the point of using from the, from the point of view of uh, the user, the access to his computer or some files that he wants to use. Here I want to, to, to hopefully explain a little bit um, the rationale behind Ethereum. Ethereum is, has other properties uh, that are very, very suitable for some applications, not all applications, meaning in the future, uh, there still will be many, many applications that are better to run in centralized systems. 
Um, but let me give you an example of how powerful um, for a specific application, which has been the holy grail of explaining Ethereum to the average person, the power of it is um, the example of real estate. So um, remember that uh, we talk about exchanging goods and services, but there are a very, very important good in, in the world that is real estate that the representation of ownership of that uh, good is a paper, a note, again, because you cannot take the land or the house with you every time that you go out for that uh, simple and logic reason. Um, so land till this day in many, many countries uh, is not something this is not settled and there's fights over land. If not, just watch what is happening in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so for a nation, it's very important to the, to understand who owns what land, right? So you need to to have a some kind of uh, system that registers that. And in the modern era, most countries, they do have those systems. But in Ethereum then, because uh, it has some characteristics, it's a public network. You cannot change historically the network, so it has the property of being immutable. Um, and um, well, we will. Well, the other property I just I was just thinking, but like the other property that I want to mention, obviously, is uh, money. Okay. Um, so, so I'll try to explain. L let me finish with the example of real estate. So now you have um, a decentralized system that can be accessed worldwide, that can anyone can have a copy of it. So if a government decides, let's say, to put the real estate um, here in Mexico, we'll call it um, registro público de la propiedad, uh, some offices that are called notarías and the paper they give you are called escrituras. So uh, hopefully you, in your language, you get uh, the notion of what I'm talking about. It's the paper that the government give you so that uh, it says that you own certain kind of property. Uh, if a government, this is true, this is for real. Uh, I mean, in Ethereum now, there's running several uh, examples, but in, in this case, it needs to be backed up by, by the government. So basically, you can put this, um, you, you can put this information and you can attach the value of the property within the paper and the magic comes on the, at the peer to peer level transaction. So if I am going now to, let's see, you are in the other side of, of the computer, uh, I don't know, in whatever part of the world. And I tell you, okay, I'll, I want to sell you this office. And you tell me, of course, what is it, blah, blah, blah. Um, now, if the world would put the real estate on, on blockchain, Literally, you can check right now, we can check both of us in front that what I'm saying is true, that this property exists, it's well registered and so on and so forth. And then we can agree on a price, right? Let's say I tell you, yeah, 
I will sell it to you uh, for 100,000 US. Uh, let's start talking more in the language of uh, crypto. This is the key aspect of Ethereum. Uh, now it, it has its own economic layer, which is Ether. So uh, I will tell you, well, I will, t I will, I will sell this property to you at, uh, uh, let's say 35 ethers, right? And, and we say, yes, yes. And then you give me your address and then I'll send you the contract, meaning the transaction. And in just an amount of less than 30 seconds, uh, you will receive not just the money, meaning ether, but the paper. Um, so that's quite magical. Um, this is, I mean, for people that is learning to program in Solidity, this is a, a, a an, an example that um, everybody do. But like again, for the average person, probably they don't know. Um, so this changed a whole industry. Yeah, but but there are some very interesting things that that can happen. That transaction now is available for the world literally to see. So everyone can check around the world who owns what. So that application is very, very powerful. It's transparent, it's fast, it's very cheap. <laughs> so many good attributes, um, but that's just one of them. Um, again, as I said, there are hundreds of them, if not millions of applications. Um, so, uh, I gave you that example. Now I just want to talk a, a little bit about um, the logic. So, so what kind of application uh, distributed system like this is good for? Um, so let's let's remember that the whole purpose of uh, what the word blockchain was. Um, developed for uh, applying to these systems. Remember that uh, Bitcoin in the paper, it never says that it was a blockchain, but uh, after the accomplishment and the implementation of the system and the successful of it, people start naming this technology blockchain. Um, you, you you need to spend so so the difference with a um, centralized mo uh, I'm sorry centralized computer is that here you have um, an incent an economic incentive not just now for um, the economic layer meaning ether but for the code so uh, probably this part is um, not very well known i believe so what does that mean is like holding code in ethereum it has a cost uh, hopefully you can imagine why um, let me give you another example for example um, uh, when you use, I don't know, Instagram or Facebook and you take pictures, there's an infinite amount of uh, uh, use of storage, meaning memory of computers that needs to go into those systems so that they can hold all this data. That is very, very, very expensive. Uh, why they are able to give you that for free? Well, because they need to build business model models behind it with your data, with your information, basically advertising, right? But it's, it's quite expensive. 
Well, in, in Ethereum, uh, the value is in front of your eyes. So if you are, let's say, if you are de developing a, so a social network in Ethereum, then, um, I mean, you can come up with new business models, but like, uh, actually you can charge directly for the storage that someone uh, so, so what I mean, let's say you build an Instagram, uh, and let's compare a centralized system. Suppose that you don't want to advertise on Instagram. So Instagram tells you, well, let's talk about YouTube, right? Because this is true of YouTube, Instagram, I, I haven't seen it, but like in YouTube, you don't want to, I mean, you want to watch a content, but you don't, you don't want to, to see advertising. So now you pay a subscription, right? Um, so hopefully you understand. In Ethereum, you can build the same, but like you need to build to pay directly for the storage. But now the question is, what is cheaper? Uh, if you run a YouTube in Ethereum, which is in its early days, probably it's much more expensive than paying a subscription to YouTube. Uh, I don't know about that. I, I don't know any application about video on, on Ethereum, but Ethereum is uh, a much more slower computer. Um, so basically you need to think of Ethereum of a uh, computer of 30 years ago in capacity, just because all these distributed nodes, they need to uh, agree on the transactions. The transactions, it means to run the code. So. Uh, they are not as fast as computers that we use in, our, in, in our, even in our phones. Okay. Um, but what you can do for sure is like, um, you can make transparent. Let's say if you want to store something, uh, you can say, okay, this is for free in the sense that the value of the transaction is given by the network, not by you. Um, so the computation of in, in Ethereum is done by something that is called gas. And, um, this is important to understand for gauge cash because, um, uh, we needed to wait for, um, the advancements of these technologies. And hopefully in the future we will, we are blockchain agnostic because the transaction fee, we want it to be close to zero or zero if possible. So Polygon now is accomplishing that with very, very lower fees. For our application now, uh, the technology is, is good enough um, in the sense of decentralized computers that I can actually take over centralized systems. Um, with all the benefits. Um, so again, uh, what are the characteristics that um, you can think for this, for using a decentralized computer or not? Well, you will need money to run whatever you want to run in Ethereum. So you need to think about cleaning the code to be very clean, meaning very uh, well done, as light as possible. Um, because every line of code, it, it has a cost. Uh, so you need to think about efficiency, but for many application, uh, this incentivize a good use of the code and that the computer is very efficient because if not, you, you need to pay a lot of money and, um, for the application that you want to do, if the, the money, uh, because an impediment, then you cannot run, you cannot run your your software, and and that that is uh, that separates what you can do or what you should do in Ethereum, right? Um, so again, um, participating in these networks now it becomes again the the topic of game theory in the sense of 
is it convenient for you to participate um, in whatever capacity if you want to be a node and get rewards uh, you need to put computational power and electricity so you need to provide something to the network in the case if you want to develop what is called a d app decentralized application and you want to make money of it you better think of something that um, you get more of what you're putting down. So for the first time, you need to think about money in, in, in a direct sense. What I mean is it's inheriting the network, okay? Every line of code costs. Um, that's different from programming an application in other uh, Turing complete systems, for example, Linux, which is open source, you can write pretty good stuff. And if you want, you can give it for free to the world, but not, not in Ethereum, right? Um, so, um, what is the 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 large conclusion of, over what I have just explained is that um, Bitcoin and Ethereum are very, very different things. Um, and after even, even both projects have a very short life compared to other systems, they have been pretty successful, but I can tell you for sure that the Ethereum should be more valuable than Bitcoin by this time now. Why it is not like that? Well, I believe it's because lack of knowledge in these simple um, characteristics to understanding that what is what. Um, so, uh, Um, so let's say that uh, Ethereum is uh, disruption number two, okay? So when you sit next time in a table and um, somebody ask you, well, why are all these currencies in the crypto doing or trying to do the same thing? Well, that's a wrong question, okay? Uh, they are not trying to do this, the same thing. Um, from just this, the, the, the two first example, big examples, they, they have different purposes. Um, so let's now talk a little bit about um, Ethereum economics. And again, what I want to talk about is uh, more specifically, specifically the issuance model. So the issuance model of uh, Ethereum is for our purposes is the same as Bitcoin in the sense that uh, it has scarcity built in it. Although um, it was um, done differently um, Ethereum uh, uses another um, crypt cryptographic hash, uh, meaning another system. Um, well, that, that's another topic. Uh, it started with, with something that is called, again, proof of work. Um, maybe in the future, I will make a lecture on what is, how these uh, mechanisms works. Um, but that 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 part is quite technical. 
So for our purpose now is um, uh, the insurance model basically uh, looks like this. Uh, so this is time, this is quantity, quantity of ether, and it goes like this. So basically uh, tends to zero. This is um, many, many years in the future. So right now we are like here with um, uh, 120 million. Uh, they were thinking of cutting off uh, or making it finite in the future and close it at 240 uh, million total circulating supply. Uh, if not, it will continue to to be divided, just like Bitcoin. Remember, the Bitcoin was fifty over two, and then twenty five over two, and so on. Um, here is kind of the same, and but it looks different. And but but the what we want to say is that it's scarce because it's go it's going down. Um, so meaning is deflationary and it will tend to zero. So we know that even in the future, there's going to be just certain amount of ether out there. Why this? Well, the same answer as Bitcoin. The idea is now that, um, we have a service, um, the service is different from Bitcoin. So the service of Bitcoin was to provide you with a tool if you want to send value if you're using a technology and technology that solves the double spending problem. You can do so using Bitcoin. And whatever the market gives uh, value to that service, it is going to be the value of Bitcoin. Again, uh, it's wrong to say that it is based on nothing. It is based on the loss of supply and demand. Well, the same with Ethereum. Uh, there's certain amount of ether. So let's say you want to make a game. Actually, there was a very famous crypto game that broke uh, Ethereum, the power of Ethereum at that time in 2017. It was called Crypto Kitties. It was a game in which you can produce kitties, <laughs> kittens. It was so successful that many people wanted to buy kitties. So in order for you to participate in the game, you, you need a I mean, ether, ether. So the demand of ether went up, right? Um, so again, it's just, it's just basic economics, loss of supply and demand. Um, so um, I will end this part just saying that um, now, if you go through, let's say the first 100 projects uh, listed in value valuation by coin market cap, um, some of them are variations of, um, at the beginning, let's say of, Bitcoin, for example, Litecoin or uh, Zcash, um, they improve in some aspects or different things, variations of the same code that um, was developed by Satoshi. There are others that now we can uh, think of um, decentralized computers as well. Um, for example, a Polygon, uh, Avalanche, um, Algorand, Solana. Um, they are trying to aim to different um, 
markets in the sense different applications in which sometimes you need to take decisions uh, or trade offs between speed and centralization or speed and, and gas price and um, or security and privacy and so on. So life is not easy for the development developing these uh, systems. But uh, the, the story is repeating itself in the sense that uh, not all Turing complete languages are uh, good for all applications, meaning Turing complete means you can do it, but like there are for sure some languages that uh, are more thought to to do some kinds of computations, for example, R and Python for making mathematics, science, statistics, right? And uh, Java's uh, um, to make websites and JavaScript. And uh, I mean, there's, I don't want to go into that in putting many, many examples, but again, Swift for, applications in in the App Store and Go and Flutter for apps in, in the App Stores. Um, so uh, hopefully, just like in all industries, I mean, cars as well, right? Uh, if you have a truck, then you need certain kind of machine because your purpose is transportation, so you don't want to race, right, in a Formula One truck. <laughs> So well, you need a different kind of uh, machine, although the principles are the same, right? You need tires, combustion engine, uh, uh, I mean, a car basically, but that car can, can, can be purposely built for some applications better than, than other ones. So uh, right now we are in that, the beginning of that era in which now we have starting to make some um, blockchains that are more suitable for certain applications. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, I just want to pull with, uh, rapidly another example uh, just to make the case and give you certainty about issuance, the issuance model. Um, we, have, we have a very, very beautiful project done by um, the people at Polkadot. Um, Polkadot is a project that um, the rationale, I mean, it was, uh, developed by the founders of Ethereum. And um, what they want now is to build a, a system in which you can build your own blockchain. Um, so it's a project of blockchains. So uh, the question is how do you modularize um, the creation of uh, big, a big, big decentralized set of blockchains running all at the same time. Um, so that's the next level of thinking in, in distributed systems. I mean, it's not the only one, but uh, Polkadot is quite, it's quite ambitious in that sense, um, and is people is, is working greatly to accomplish that um, very forward in thinking. And, uh, but but the, the, the thing that I want to rescue or highlight from that um, project is the Sean's model of DOT. DOT is their inner, DOT is their inner, economic system layer and actually um, 
the insurance model is the other way around. So it has not scarcity built in it, meaning it will keep growing. I don't remember if it, if it is like this or if it is like this, uh, but it doesn't matter. This is time and this is quantity. So uh, as time passes, quantity uh, uh, at time two will be more than quantity at time one, okay? That's, that's what is important. So even if we want to use um, this for um, backing up gauge cash, we can't. Um, so I'm starting to here and there um, bring in the topic of the backing up of gauge cash, which is hard to understand um, by saying that not all distributed projects that are real now that are working, that are not theoretical projects, and that are very, very well based project projects done by very, very professional people, um, and that they are bring, bringing a lot of value, something new, let's say, to the table in a big way. No, 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 all the, the economics of these projects are suitable for, uh, backing up gauge cash. So although I haven't explained how it, that works, um, but I, I, I have already said some hints that we will recover later and, and take into consideration. Um, so although Polkadot is a wonderful project just because of how its insurance model is done, uh, we cannot do that. And in, in the other hand, I just want to show again that not all uh, cryptocurrencies, which again is probably mistaken just by me starting to say that uh, is the same thing. What I want to try to highlight is that they are not. And even their insurance models are for different purposes and that it makes that the network behaves differently. So Polkadot is, is an example of this. Uh, totally different um, incentives, totally different uh, economics. Uh, so you cannot say that all crypto is equal. Um, so anyways, um, let me talk now about um let's talk about tether known better at usdt within the crypto space Um, now that we understand Bitcoin, we understand uh, Ethereum, I believe now it's better, it's going to be pretty straightforward to understand um, Tether. So uh, Tether, they understood, um, is, is a company from, from Hong Kong that since the inception of, of Bitcoin back in, I believe, I believe Tether, I mean, you can check in their website. Uh, I believe they, they released the first uh, coins uh, using what was called at that time, uh, it was 2013, if I am not wrong. Um, so Ethereum didn't exist. So they were using a layer of Bitcoin that is called uh, the Omni, chain um, and the purpose was to address the problem of Bitcoin's volatility. So they said, okay, 
there's a problem. Um, Bitcoin, I mean, if you want to use it for large transactions, it can change rapidly. So if you are a company and you want to send 100 million, let's say US, uh, USD worth of Bitcoin to another party and it takes 10 minutes and the price of Bitcoin change, I don't know, 5% in 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is, that's a lot. So you cannot take that risk. Um, so they saw that right away and they said, okay, let's bring an stable coin meaning a digital representation of the definition that we saw in the paper of Bitcoin um, using the, the same, let's say, cryptographic techniques under this omni-channel uh, uh, site change, chain, chain of blockchain, I mean, of, yeah, Bitcoin's blockchain. And Let's say that this representation of a token is back up by, by, by one dollar, okay? Um, then Ethereum came by 2015 and they understood that Ethereum was much more better. So they just created a, what is now called a ERP20 token and they still say or claim that uh, this token is back up by one dollar uh, and the story keeps going right um, when Solana was deployed in 2020 they developed a token in Solana they say it's back up by dollars in a bank that we have in Hong Kong um, so yeah it solved the problem of volatility for sure uh, it has been a very, very good business for these guys, very smart and very on time. But in reality, they are not bringing anything new to the table, right? Um, what What's the problem with Tether? Is that, uh, I mean, I am not a philosopher, uh, but for sure blockchain has some kind of uh, properties. Uh, we just talk about them, not not from religion, but from computer science. Everything that is being constructed, or, and many things are quite, uh, I would say, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of a word that, at least for me, that are at at the Nobel Prize level, right? Uh, I have said that before for about Bitcoin. Uh, so big leaps in distributed systems in computer science. And Tether is, is like going backwards uh, because basically you are trusting the person in a, in a little store taking note, right? Uh, for real, this is, this is how Tether works. Nobody knows if these guys have the amount of money uh, is now represented by tokens in in the industry. Um, I have checked the data, and um, a good approximation is that at certain peaks of of the crypto market in recent years, Tether has um, been traded at a max volume of two hundred billion. Again, 200 billion. And I can tell you for sure that um, before 2021, uh, there was the amount of the market cap of Tether was around 20 billion. And then there was moments in the marketing which is they were trading 100 billion. Um, so I will not explain a concept right now that uh, is called velocity of money that are used uh, by central banks to uh, 
so there's a question by central banks and, and say, okay, what is the amount of paper money that we need to print so people have in their pockets uh, to be able to trade in their everyday life, right? The answer cannot be infinite because we don't have the infinite amount of paper. But on the other hand, there cannot be a scarcity of paper because then the economy will crash. I'm, I'm talking about paper, paper, right? The paper bills. So that's an inventory problem, right? Uh, you need to come up with a number. Well, that number usually is one fifth of the value of the GDP by each economy in each country. Um, that's an approximation. Some use more, some use less, depends. Well, uh, using that measure is a measure per year. Um, if we apply that measure to Tether, it doesn't make any sense what they were publishing about volume versus market cap. No sense at all. Um, so I don't want to say anything because it's not the purpose of saying anything wrong about what, what we want is uh, here to explain what gauge cash is all about. So, uh, is right. It's very easy for a professional finance person to see that Tether is everything. <laughs> Blockchain, right? Uh, basically, it checked but all the bad boxes. Although, because it's a huge problem, volatility in the crypto space, uh, it has had great success. Uh, the explanation is because it's the same one as, as, as the US dollar as a reserve currency. At the end, that um, has a component, a big component of just trust. Okay. For that, um, I will give you some biography. I, I believe I already mentioned um, the book. I mean, not, not in these lectures, but to other investors and people around our project. The book of Ray Dalio about um, the world changing order. I really recommend that to you. There you can see how um, reserve currencies come to be that and how after some time they, they can switch or change to another currency from another world power. And those cycles, so it's a whole book in economics. But, but Tether, uh, the problem is that um, they are using a fiat currency as a backup, which is traditional. Nobody runs accountability of that. But even if they do, they have another big problem, which the bank is just a bank. It's not even a central bank. Holds the, the reserves and is in Hong Kong, not in the U.S. So if something happened, the question is, can the central bank of um, China or, or Hong Kong come in and bail out Tether, right? Um, why it works? Because people trust, <laughs> that's why. Uh, but there is a very well-known problem in finance called the wrong bank problem. Uh, you just saw it. I mean, I, I thought I will never see this again in my lifetime, but we just saw it in California. People making lines to get their money out from banks that are going into bank, bank wrong to see. That is the bank, <laughs> bank wrong problem, right? Uh, so what happens if people start exchanging Tether and saying to the exchanges, okay, I want my real dollars, right? The question is, um, exchanges have them. Uh, and ultimately this bank in Hong Kong has those 200 billion if they are asked at the same time, we don't know. So that's a risk. 
Still is number three, and in volume it has been number one for many, many years in the crypto space. Um, but uh, the criticize here is that um, Bitcoin has a very specific disruption behind it. Ethereum have another move forward in terms of computer science and technology. And Tether has nothing. Uh, so in 2019, when I told you we were thinking in building uh, a private uh, equity fund for Latin America, uh, one of the solutions of uh, hedging against uh, the volatility of uh, Ether was to take a stable coin like Tether. And we just didn't like the solution. It is, it is really, really backwards. Um, so here is finally where we ask ourselves, uh, can we do better? Um, so, um, or another question, can we do something at at um, the level of Bitcoin and Ethereum. In terms of um, bringing a solution to, to the problem of volatility, but using just uh, the blockchain technology in itself, their characteristics, their properties. Um, so we started the research in 2019 and we finished the economic uh, research and I went to a, a conference in Microsoft, the headquarters of Microsoft in 2019. At the end of it, and I introduced the solution this is mainly to computer scientists, and there were people there like the founder of um, Truffle, uh, some big guys uh, of Azure, um, of Microsoft, uh, the founder of Solana, Greg Fitzgerald, and other big guys in, now in the crypto industry, people from Algorand and the Ethereum Foundation, Joseph Lubin from the CEO of Consensus and so on. And we introduced this, this solution um, and we knew that if we could accomplish solving this problem, just like the other problems, remember that uh, Bitcoin was a very well-known problem, the general Byzantine problem. Um, Ethereum was, again, a very well-known problem, like how to make a decentralized computer with an economic layer. So here the question how is how do we make a stable uh, currency using just the characteristic, the economic characteristics of some blockchain? And if we could come with, with a solution, then we, we knew that we were in the path of creating the world's first. Sorry. The world's first decentralized monetary system. So again, uh, this is 2019, and now in 2023, 
we have done it. And you can you can use it. So it's it's cool times. Basically, um, it happened to me that when I was at this um, uh, event in 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 Microsoft, um, I have read in a book that I recommend to you as well. It's called um, the Blockchain Revolution. Um, people that was close to Vitalik Buterin, investors and so on in New York uh, in two thousand and fifteen when they launch the network for the first time to and they start they had a map of the world and they start looking at nodes starting to be turned on and the network start starting to to process uh, blocks um when i read that it came to my mind that that would be a pretty cool moment right uh, uh it seems to me like it should be very cool to be in when the man landed for the first time into the moon and many other examples, right? Um, so I had the, to be lucky know that Greg Fitzgerald, the founder of Solana, was there in 2019 when Solana was still a beta project. Um, but he showed in real time these notes, like in a map, worldwide map, different parts of the world, different computer, all running, uh, just like probably uh, Ethereum did, and it was pretty cool to see. Um, so now we have, we have uh, uh, Gage Cash. Gage Cash, it's in its early infancy, just like Bitcoin in 2009. Um, so imagine we just finished like Satoshi Nakamoto, the script. We are putting it out there. Um, so we don't expect people to grasp the whole concept right away. But now, um, we will show the technology so, um, in the next lectures. I will show the technology. Um, we, we make a transaction. We will prove that it works. Uh, and then I'll start explaining. Uh, with now all this knowledge that you have about Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Tether, um, why gauge cash can become a very, hopefully, very important project in the history of uh, distributed systems and finance. Um, well, this is for everything that I wanted to share in this second lecture and um, till the next one, okay?